Good morning and a warm welcome to another virtual session of the U3A here in Hermanus. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Professor Kovas Dubasani. He is a professor of history at the Northwestern University in Potchefstroom. He is also the editor and co-author of a book entitled Son of the Felt, Pilgrim of the World, which deals with the life and the history surrounding General Jan Smuts. It's certainly a very important figure in our history that is not always recognized today. And I'm therefore very glad that we can present this presentation, which Professor Dubisani has prepared. Kubus, thank you very much for your time, and we're looking forward to the presentation. Thanks, Gert. Morning, everyone. As Gert said, my talk this morning is on Jan Smits as international statesman. On the 21st of October 1942, Jan Smuts, the Prime Minister of South Africa and Field Marshal in the Allied Command, delivered a famous speech before the members of both houses of the British Parliament in London. He gave a broad outline of the world situation in the turmoil of the Second World War when the war, barely visibly, had begun to turn in favour of the Allies and he outlined his vision for the first war world. When Smuts had finished speaking, Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, indicated his respect for Smuts by saying to the audience, quote, I ask you to signify your feelings by rising and giving him the acclamation which his character, his life work, equally deserve, end of quote. When the resounding applause from the British parliamentarians had at last died down, they joined in an enthusiastic rendition of For oh, He's a Jolly Good Fellow. The 72-year-old Smuts, at the height of his career, was clearly the darling of the British Commonwealth at a turning point in world history. Exactly how great was Smuts's reputation and fame? Herman Gilomir, the well-known, labels Smuts as a true world figure. He writes, quote, In the 20th century, Jan Smuts and Nelson Mandela were the two South Africans who were regarded in their highest esteem in world opinion. End of quote. And that opinion was confirmed by a poll at the beginning of the 21st century in 20, uh, 2004. On the 24th of May, 2020, this year, the 150th anniversary of Jan Smuts's birth was commemorated. In this talk, I intend to look at some highlights of Smuts's career with a focus on his role as an international statesman. I'll start by showing that the concept of holism formed the basis of Smuts's statecraft. After that, I'll discuss Smuts's contributions to the founding of the Union of South Africa, his entry onto the international stage during the First World War, his role in the foundation of the League of Nations, the British Commonwealth and the United Nations. I'll mention some of the honours bestowed on him and then conclude with an attempted answer to the question whether Jan Smuts was the greatest South African of the 20th century. How did Smuts use the idea of holism in his statecraft? Jan Smuts spent his first years on his parents' farm outside Freebeck West. During his wanderings in the felt, he became a close observer of nature. Later in life, he would become a scientist in his own right in the field of botany as an expert on African grasses. His ideas of the interrelatedness of things must have taken shape in his mind quite early. He went to formal school for the first time at the age of 12 after his elder brother had died. He completed his school career and his first degree at Victoria College in Stellenbosch in record time. He won a scholarship and he left for Christ College in Cambridge to study law. There he was the top student, won prizes and gained admission to the bar 
He was such a brilliant student that Lord Todd, principal of Christ College, later said that the three outstanding students in the 500-year history of the college were John Milton, Charles Darwin, and Jan Smits. It was at Cambridge that Smits first formulated his ideas about holism in an essay he wrote on Walt Whitman. Later in life, he further developed these ideas. Sporadically, when he had time during his busy career, he worked on a treatise called An Inquiry into the Whole. When he was ousted from government office in 1924, he sat down in his study at uh, Dwarenkov in Irene and completed the manuscript of his book in a few weeks. It was published in 1926 with the title Holism and Evolution. You see the cover of the book on the screen there. Smits is regarded as the father of holism, although he was not the first person to reflect on the relationship between parts and wholes. In his text, Smith showed that he was aware of the latest developments in scientific thinking. Albert Einstein said that Smith was one of only a handful of people who understood his theory of relativity. For Smith, holism was the creative and coordinating principle that kept the parts of complex organisms together. Holism became a prominent topic of discussion in scientific circles and an influential concept in some disciplines. Smith's rose in esteem and he received invitations to address scientific associations. What is important in this talk is that Smith put his, holistic, his holistic ideas in practice in his contributions to the design of the structures of the Union of South Africa, the League of Nations, the British Commonwealth and the United Nations. Smith, with his concept of holism, was the driving force behind the founding of South Africa as a unified state. He first entered into politics as state attorney from 1898 in Paul Kreer's Afrikaanse Republic. He also acted as Kreer's peacemaker in negotiations with Milner and others. However, to no avail because the British were intent on war to get control over the country's gold. Uh, on his return from, from Cambridge, Smits had befriend, befriended uh, Cecil John Rhodes and Onse Jan Hofmeyer at the Cape. However, Rhodes' involvement in the Jameson raid disillusioned him. Under the influence of Greer's Boer nationalism, he wrote the major part of a Transvaal propaganda booklet in Eeuw van Onrecht, A Century of Wrong. You see uh, a picture on the screen of the cover of one of the editions of that uh, booklet. In it, he made a sharp attack on British imperialism in Southern Africa. He worked out a military strategy for the looming war against Britain. During the Second Anglo-Boer War between 1899 and 1902, Smits, one of the very few Transvaalers who had any book knowledge on military strategy, was soon promoted to the rank of general. His best known contribution to the Boer War effort was when he led a Boer commando into the Cape Colony in 1901 to try and split the British forces and raise sympathy and support for the Boer Republic's among the Dutch-speaking farmers in the Cape Colony. On the map, you can see the route of the invasion. Smits's commando ended up in the Macquarland from where he was recalled in 1902 to participate in the peace negotiations which ended the war. The nice Wright, author of the very well-known book Commando and later member of the Smits cabinet was impressed by Smits's death-defying courage on the battlefield. After the war, Smits entered Transvaal politics again uh, in the Milner era as a leader of the Head Folk Party. His admiration for, for the British was restored during his visit um, 
in 1905 to England to appeal to the incoming Premier Henry Campbell Bannerman to grant self-government to the former Boer republics. Campbell Bannerman agreed to his request. Smuts was indebted to him for his generosity. In 1907, Smuts became Minister of Education of the Transvaal under Louis Boeta. That was the time when his time, when his path crossed that of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, but that um, part of Smith's uh, career is not really relevant to this talk. As a delegate from the Transvaal, Smuts played a key role in the National Convention in 1908 and 1909, where the unification of the four South African colonies was discussed. Something which was in line with his holistic thinking. There were differences of opinion over the capital city, the official language and the franchise in the United South Africa. But compromises uh, made and these issues were eventually resolved. Smuts made a major contribution in designing the structure of the future Union of South Africa by drafting its constitution. He and Boeta took the proposed constitution to the British government. The South Africa Act was passed by the British Parliament and on the 31st of May 1910, the Union of South Africa became a reality. Boeta was Prime Minister and Smuts second in command in his cabinet. Only four years later, the First World War broke out. It was the Great War that catapulted Smuts to international fame. At first, as Minister of Defence, Smuts operated in the domestic sphere. The Union Defence Forces quickly quelled the Africana rebellion against South African participation in Britain's war. By refusing to pardon Yopi Fouri, found guilty of treason and condemned to death, Smiths alienated nationalistic Afrikaners. Early in 1915, the Union Defence Forces invaded German South Africa and soon controlled the territory. Later in the same year, Smiths was appointed as Lieutenant General in the British Army and Theatre Commander of the Allied Forces in East Africa. He was relatively successful in driving the German troops from the Kilimanjaro region to the Usambara mountain range, but was a cautious commander and failed to defeat the smaller forces of General Major General von Leto Purbeck. Smith was called back in 1917 and sent uh, to represent the Union at an Imperial War Conference and the deliberations of the Imperial War Cabinet in London. There, he was asked by David Lloyd George to become part of the British War Cabinet. He, he was appointed as chairman of the committee that organized London's air defense and established the Royal Air Force. He headed the War Priorities Committee. He contributed to British strategy in the First World War and was sent on different types of missions to Wales, to France, to Egypt, to Palestine. Hence, his detractors nicknamed him the handyman of the empire. The significance of his two years in London was that Smuts was accepted in the inner circle of the British government and allied command. He made a name for himself in the British world. When he returned to South Africa in 1919, he was a member of the British Privy Council, a companion of honor, holder of honorary degrees from British universities and the freedom of several British cities. Before his return, however, he played a significant role in the formation of the League of Nations, the World Peace Organization that was supposed to prevent another global war. Immediately after the war, Jan Smits and Louis Boeta, as representatives of South Africa, joined the British delegation at the Paris peace negotiations. There, Smuts warned the peace negotiators not to be too harsh 
in the terms of the peace treaty and to reduce the war reparations enforced upon Germany, the French and the British public demanded revenge and Smits's warning was not heeded. He was disillusioned and would not have put his signature on the Treaty of Versailles if it was not for his loyalty to Buddha. Today we know that Smuts was right. The harsh terms of the treaty were the first act in the events that would culminate in the Second World War. Before his participation in the peace conference, Smuts, in bed with the flu in Oxford in December 1918, had written a 36-page document titled The League of Nations A Practical Suggestion. In this document, he set out his ideas about the envisaged international peacekeeping body. Woodrow Wilson, you see his uh, photograph on the screen, he was president of the USA and he advocated the establishment of such a multilateral peace organization. He was so impressed by Smith's proposal that he revised his own design for the League of Nations to incorporate Smuts's plan. Smuts served on the committee that drew up the covenant of the League of Nations. Unfortunately, in the unstable interwar world, the League of Nations did not achieve much success. When Louis Boetard died in 1919, Smuts succeeded him as Prime Minister of the Union of South Africa. His South African party was losing Afrikaner support to General Herzog's National Party. Only through forming a coalition with the Unionist Party did he manage to stay in go government after the 1921 election. You see a picture there of his cabinet, which he formed after the election. However, his harsh suppression of the 1922 Rand mine workers strike cost him many votes. A pact between the National Party and Cresswell's Labour Party toppled Smuts's government in the 1924 election. For Smuts, the success of the British Empire proved his holistic conception that the whole is always more than its constituent parts. In a meeting of the Commonwealth Heads of Government in 1930, he said that the British Commonwealth comprising one-fourth of the human race and the globe is something far greater than has ever existed before in history. That, those were his exact words. In his first term as Prime Minister, between 1919 and 1924, Smuts was working towards the conversion of the empire into the Commonwealth in which the dominions, including South Africa, would have the status of autonomous entities. It is self-governing states under the British crown. Before he could make much progress in this direction, he was out of office after the 1924 election. It was left to his successor as Prime Minister, General Barry Herzog, to conclude his work in this regard and lead the Union to autonomous status. During his time, uh, in opposition between 1924 and 1933, Smuts had time to focus on his scientific work. Holism and Evolution was published in 1926 and he became involved in the scientific debates of that uh, period. I just want to make sure that I have the right slide up here. Um, okay, let's, um, sorry, sorry, Chet, um, I just want to go back a bit. Okay, uh, fine. In this period, he also delivered his Rhodes Lectures at Oxford in 1929, in which he stated his ideas about race relations. Smuts was a segregationist. 
He believed that only through racial set the traditional culture, culture of Africans in South Africa could be protected. He realized that the human needs of the African population should be satisfied by giving them better education, better jobs, social services, but he was opposed to giving them equal political rights. Only in his last years, in correspondence with friends, he admitted that it was becoming clear that segregation was not the final answer to the country's racial question. Smuts's views on holism had the effect of involving him in academic, dis academic disputes. Arthur Tansley, a leading British ecologist and others one-sidedly linked Smuts's ideas about race to his holism and alleged that he used holism to try and justify racial discrimination and oppression in South Africa. In 1931, Smuts was elected as president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, just reward for his promotion of the sciences. In a much return to power in a time of crisis, that was the time of the Great Depression and of the Great Drought, forced him and Herzog, who had been political opponents since 1914, to join forces. The South African Party and the National Party formed a uh, coalition government. They won the election and they fused into one party, the United Party. Smuts became Deputy Prime Minister in Herzog's cabinet. Five years later, their differences on the issue of South Africa's neutrality in the British war caused their ways to part again. When the Second World War started, Smuts won the majority vote in Parliament and he became Prime Minister again from 1939 to 1948. Smuts was almost 70 years old when the war started. Too old to be a commander of forces on the battlefield. He was not, however, uh, too old to give strategic advice. His influence on Churchill is well known and it's also, it was also depicted recently in 2017 in a movie uh, named Churchill. Smuts's primary task as commander of the South African armed forces in the Second World War was to prevent Germany and Italy from defeating the Allies and taking control in North Africa. My own father fought for Smuts and Pinar in North Africa. He was captured at the Brook and he was a prisoner of war for the rest of the war. On Smuts's birthday, the 24th of May 1941, he received the highest military honor of his career when King George VI appointed him as Field Marshal. Because he was held in such high esteem by world leaders, it was not surprising that Smith played a significant role in the proceedings at the meeting in San Francisco in 1945, where the United Nations organization was set up. He was the only leader who played a prominent role in the formation of both the League of Nations and the United Nations. It was Smits who formulated the first draft of the section on human rights in the preamble to the UN Charter. His proposal read, quote, we declare our faith in basic human rights, in the sacredness, essential worth and integrity of the human personality and affirm our resolve to establish and maintain social and legal sanctions for safeguarding the same." End of quote. Here, Smuts stated that the human personality and basic human rights were the highest good that needed to be safeguarded. In Holism and Evolution, his book, he argued that the human personality was the highest form of holism. It was very ironic that when the UN General Assembly met for the first time in 46, it was the self same Smiths who came under fire for the abuse of human rights when India made a formal complaint about the treatment of Indians 
in the Union of South Africa. The list of honors and awards that Smuts received during his lifetime is too long to discuss at length here. On the screen, you see a summary. You can, for example, see that he had the freedom of 18 cities. He received 29 honorary doctorates. One of his highest awards was the British Order of Merit, which he received in 1946 towards the end of his life. This order was founded by Edward VII in 1902 to reward those who provided especially eminent service in the armed forces or particularly distinguished themselves in science, art, literature or the promotion of culture. Admission into this order remains the personal gift of the sovereign and is restricted to a maximum of 24 living recipients from the Commonwealth, plus a limited number of honorary members. Interestingly, there have been no honorary members of the Order of Merit, Merit since the death of the last such member, Nelson Mandela, in December 2013. This brings me to the question whether Smits was the greatest South African of the 20th century. In the years after the Second World War, there were some highlights, such as the royal visit in 1947. He also attended the wedding of Elizabeth and Philip. However, the last years what were not the happiest of Smits's life. The United Party lost the 1948 election to the National Party. At the age of 78, as was the case in 1924, Smuts became the leader of the opposition once again. During the last years of his life, he suffered other setbacks. One of his sons, Yapi, and his closest political ally, Jan Hofmeier, both died in 1948. He himself died at the age of 80 on the 11th of September 1950, on his farm Dorenkloof in Irene near Pretoria. In the book on Smuts, of which I was the editor, we compared Smuts to the other 13 heads of government of South Africa since 1910. I conclude by reading one paragraph from the book. Quote, the quantifiable data suggests that Smuts has thus far been the number one South African head of government since Union in 1910. He played a decisive role at various levels. As an intellectual, perhaps with the exception of Verbot, he made a more significant contribution than any of the others. No other head of government, except perhaps P.W. Boeta, can be co compared to Smuts when it comes to military involvement and expertise. As a politician, he made his mark on South African pol politics for longer than any other head of government, although his success at the polls and the acceptability of his policies reflect poorly when compared to several of the others. As a statesman, he certainly made more concrete contributions to international law and international organization than any of the other premiers. Ultimately, it cannot be denied that Smuts's thinking, his intellectual brilliance, and especially his vision of holism, are universal attributes that accord him a lasting legacy. He experienced success and met with failure as a statesman, premier, and politician, but he left physical and spiritual monuments for posterity which cannot be ignored. That's the end of the quote. Sorry. Now, oh, that's the last slide. There you can see the covers of our books, the Afrikaans one, which was published in 2017 on the left hand side, and the English version of the book uh, on the right hand side was published in 2019 uh, both by Pritia Bookhouse 
the Afrikaans one is sold out, but the English one is still available at bookstores. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dad. That's the end of my talk. Kubus, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation. What an amazing man. Can I ask you one question? Do you think he invited the royal family to visit South Africa in 1947 as a boost for his election in the following year, 1948? I'm not sure that was um, one of the motives. Of course, the United Party had a very big election victory in 1943 during the war. So at that point, I don't think the Smuts and the government felt threatened by the National Party. But towards the end of the war, of course, things started changing, you know, and when the wars uh, ended and the soldiers returned, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with various aspects of government, government policy. There was also the changing situation with the influx of, of black workers into the urban areas, which the uh, National Party could use quite the far black scare sort of uh, uh, rhetorics. So definitely by 47, the, the royal visit would, of course, enhance uh, Smuts' um, stature and it uh, could play a role in the election campaign. So, uh, yeah. I'm not sure exactly when he sent the invitation. It must have been quite some time before that, but um, yes, uh, there is no doubt that um, it was uh, one of the motives was to boost um, the support for the, for the United Party. Kubus, did Smuts participate in the war in 1915 in German Southwest Africa? He did this. He was uh, commander of one of the forces. There were, as far as I can remember, there were two main uh, South African forces that invaded uh, German Southwest Africa, and Smuts was commander of one of them. But that went very quickly because there was not much um, German resistance. The, the German military presence in German Southwest Africa was rather small. As you know, it's a huge territory. So uh, without much trouble, the Union forces obtained a victory there in, sh in, a, in a couple of months or so. And after that, of course, Smuts then was um, sent to East Africa to be commander of the Allied forces there. In terms of his um, stay in uh, London in the First World War, he as I said, was the one that uh, was the founder of the Royal Air Force. He also, just soon after, was the founder of the South African Air Force. So he was the, the guy who launched both the two oldest air forces in the world, British and South Africa. Kubus, thank you very much for a very well-presented history about an amazing man, a man that is not often recognized in this country. Thank you for everybody that participated and thank you for your preparation. I'm going to end the meeting now. Goodbye.